Hi, it's Tony from CassetteComeback.com. So the world's going a bit crazy at the moment and my my thoughts go out to you in America, I really do at the moment. Uh, but there's enough people jumping on that bandwagon trying to get publicity out of it, so I'm not going to go there. Just to say, let's concentrate on something more fun than all this stuff which is in the news. And that is the Maxell UL. Or rather, the cassette that it morphed into. The legendary Max UR, which is still being made today. And this is a 1985 version, and I remember buying this in the day and loving it. And the UR really is a staple of cassettes. You know, TDK had its D, which I did a video on. Sony had its HF, which I did a video on. This is Max L's version. And we went from the 85 to the 88 with the oval shell. Now this one is very, very nostalgic to me. I used to buy these back in the day, I used to get them in like 10 packs and they must have been reasonably priced for me to buy them in the late 80s because I was only just going into double digits then. And um, I remember using these a lot. They always sounded good, they always looked good and they were so reasonably priced. These are what, you know, I, I used to give cassettes to other people on as well as recording stuff myself. And then this design stuck with Maxell for a while because, you know, we went on to into the 90s and you can't see it under here, but essentially it's the same cassette, but just with different printing on it. Now, I'll put that one at the back because I've only got them in three packs, to be to be fair. I haven't got them in uh, in singles. And then it, we continued through and I haven't got all of them here, but I'm just going through a few which I like, you know, these Maxell URs essentially the same as those underneath. And then we had some little quirks like the Maxell Original UR, which uh, we'll, we'll have a look at this one. And then we came to the end of it, which is this UR, which is still pretty readily available. But I'm not going to go into too much depth on this one because that got a look in on the last video. And why has my camera gone all a funny colour? I think it's the greens. It doesn't like the If we take the greens out, does it go back to normal? Hmm, bizarre. Yeah, it is. It's the green. It sets the camera off. Anyway, so these are the Matso URs that mostly make up the range. So what are we going to look at today? Well, we're not going to look at this one because I've given that a fair bit of a look at in the last video. I think we should look at the original because it, it was only around for a certain amount of time. So we should have a listen to that. The 88 because it's my favourite UR. And the 85 because it's a great UR and it was the first one. These two are pretty much the same as the 88, just minor cosmetic differences. Some will argue the tape's different, but um, yeah, I mean, this is strange because um, I don't have, like I say, all the Maxell URs here because I just simply don't have them all. But in between sort of this one in the 90s and this one, there was another version. I'll, I'll, I'll bring a picture of it up here. Bing which wasn't like these, and yet around 96, they turned into these again, um, which is strange. Sort of must have found a load of shells and uh, decided to use them up. But yeah, so let's have a look at the three we're going to concentrate on today. So I'm going to try, because I keep getting told by Tony Cruz, I'm not opening this correctly. So what he says, the way to open these correctly is to find the seam at the back. Okay, so the seam's there at the back, right? And he says to, to go along it. You see, it's trickier than it sounds that. And then go down the seam at the side. And I don't know whether it's my, my pen knife that isn't working properly or something, but I just, I just, he says it's so simple and yet I struggle doing this. You see, I'm not finding any seam there, bugger it, I'll turn it open, right. So, yeah, it, it's this, this, art, this green, this green sets my camera going crazy, doesn't it? Right, so let's see if we can focus it back on this, but yeah, I've got a broken shell on this. That's why I picked this one out of the B-stop pile because, you know, so... The shell on this is really beautiful and it's, um, you know, it's the same shell that they used on the, 
from what I can tell, like the uh, the UD one and the UD two, the XL two has a bit of a different um, different texture to it. But you know, for an entry level cassette, this looks great and it sounds great. In fact, I'm sorry, this this is a bit finicky of me now, but. I've got to do this because these, these these don't look right to me without this sticker on. It really doesn't. It looks looks a bit lost. These need this sticker. There we go. That's how it should look. And if you look on, um, if you like Google cassette tape, a picture. One of the first ones you get is somebody making you know a vector art version of this tape. It is that iconic looking. Uh, the J card is pretty much what the J card is. Dynamic rendition of live music new ph pure crystal gamma ferric oxide ah crystal gamma which, which sony tried to uh, use a lot of later easy to use high precision cassette design yeah it really is this is a great shell i mean this is probably one of the best shells that an entry level cassette ever came in well, the four the unique four function leader with the head cleaning leader, the A and B side mark, arrows indicating the tape travel and five second queuing. You know, this this still came from a time when when even low end cassettes were sort of premium. But yeah, this is uh, yeah, that's that's a beautiful, beautiful cassette. Love that one. Even though the case it all smashed. Right, let's have a look at the 88, which the the green sends a camera funny. Um yeah, I'm sorry, Tony. I'm, I, I don't have the time. I'm just going to do this to crap way. There we go. So, like I say, what does it say on the back of this one? It's going to be Cameron to Spaz. Clear, expansive, high quality sound. Again, no, more pure crystal magnetic particles. Easy to use. Easy to use cassette. Well, what difficult to use cassettes are they? You, you slide them in. But again, this, this, this is a beautiful shell. You know, it, it, later ones, or at least copies, you know, it, it, I don't know if you can tell, but there is actually a little ridge there, and it goes from clear to uh, to semi-opaque on these shells, and it wasn't like that on all of them. The ridge is at the bottom, but like I say, this is just such a nostalgic cassette to me. It really is, because I use so many of these, and I love them. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful cassette. Again, the... Uh, these had um, very unique labels because they're curved. Look, I'll again, I'll I'll show you. It doesn't look naked as well this one, but they were kind of tricky. You had to line it up properly, otherwise it wouldn't quite look right. There we go. And yeah, it just curved in at the top. It was really nice. And on later ones, like this one, I don't know if you can see. There's there's a window there because they did away with these cassettes and you just put a regular straight one straight across which wasn't quite as nice as the 88 max hell lineups were uh again the four function header leader i should say and that's that one now this one is a strange one because it's max hell original you are and on the back it just doesn't say a lot it just says no that's what it's used for dictation and your car and the walkman not so good for the boom box but these however I've, I've had two different types of tape in this wrapper again it's like a mix of but this is one of the better ones because if we look now them hubs to me i want to say gold star but they're not the these are tricky hubs i think this is basf or mtech Okay, this is BSF. If you can, if you look now, we've lost the traditional Maxell leader, which the other cassettes talk about. This cassette case is really broken because these two are genuine Maxell, and they still have these leaders. If you look, you know, the traditional Maxell arrowed leader. This one, this one doesn't. It's just plain. So. Uh, Oh, you know something. I got the bick, I put it on the side and I've dropped it. Hang on, one second. Right, there we go. So, if we put the bick in, let's have a look at the differences in the tape.
Yeah, you see, look, that's got the 777777, that, that says BASF to me. So, if we look at the differences, the, the 85 and the 88, if we can focus on it, have very similar shiny, dark, grey brown, whereas the Maxo UR original has a very deep chocolatey brown. So, uh, yeah, there is a difference in the tape there, but different manufacturers. But between the 85 and the 88, I can't see a lot of difference, but it'll be interesting to see how they perform. So, let us now get a bit boring, but you guys seem to like it, so I'll keep on doing them. Let's fire up a deck and get these graphed on a frequency sweep and see how they compare over the years. So I'm using my Marantz PMD 520 again to do this frequency sweep. And unlike in the last video with the U new URs, I've actually tuned the balance a little bit so that when I do it to get the baseline, it's pretty much left and right channels are all synced together. It wasn't in the other video, so yeah. Anyhow, I sometimes warrant, you know, how how useful these graphs are. I mean, but you guys like them and I'm nothing if a progressive channel that likes to listen to its viewers sometimes anyway so we can see straight away that pretty much up until about three kilohertz these three different max cells two of which are from max cell and one is probably basf perform pretty much the same way just with little variances in volume if you will i mean if we we look here which is the right channel of the 88 ur here and we compare it to the uh, right channel of the 85 UR, which is the highest. There's about 0.74 decibels difference. There's not a massive amount in it. Um, up until about 3 kilohertz. And then we, we sort of see some differences here. Because we've got like this, which is the left channel of the 88 UR. And if we look at that compared to the right channel, which is up here. It's quite um, a difference of 1.5 decibels between the left and right channels of the 88 UR and that's probably the biggest difference of the lot but that's only at just I think it's about 12,000 hertz so uh yeah it's it, you know when you're listening up there only dogs can really hear it properly <laughs> but that's about it but other than that they all seem to perform pretty linear pretty much the same yeah it's what you'd expect so that's the boring graph bit over with. Now let's, like I say, use the real test of a tape. Those little frequency analyzers strapped to the side of our heads called our ears. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to use the Revox today and something I haven't pointed out, I don't think anyhow, but I should have done, but uh, anyway, is that the this Revox is not a 250 nanoweber's meter deck, i.e. this is not a Dolby deck, if you will. It does have Dolby, but it's not the Dolby scale. Nakamichi's are 250 nanoweber per meter scale, so what that means is if I record on a NAC at zero, and put it into a Revox, it's going to play back in the Revox at minus three. And likewise, if I record at zero in the Revox, it'll play back in a NAC at plus three because the scales are just simply different on the VU meters. Um, so just thought I'd point that one out in case I haven't before. Anyway, we've got the 1985 URN. It's all biased up and we're going to play something from the YouTube audio library. And this is called regrets mm, i don't have many regrets but anyway um peaking at zero let's have a see how this 35 year old you are sounds
it's a 35 year old entry level cassette the positives are the shell's beautiful it looks great and it did a really good copy <laughs> difference uh, very very visibly but um, I did try this as well with Dolby and it doesn't seem to like Dolby that much neither so hmm but it's beautiful it's iconic it's well made and it does capture the highs and it captures the bass it just captures it with a lot of hiss in there so let's move on now to my personal favorite yours the 1988 which has very similar looking tape in it so let's get this one biased up there we go, yeah, stop that other song from playing in the background, shall we? Like I say, I do like these oval shells, they're really pretty. I mean, it looks just so nice, just, just there in the deck with the little outline on it. And like I said, the later ones, it's not physically moulded, it's just like they, they've printed the oval on it just for the heck of it. Okay, that one is now biased up. And let's play something else. Now, this is called Luxury, but it's spelled L U X E R Y. So let's have a see how this one sounds. Again, great looking, does a really good job of reproduction. I mean, you've got to think, when these were new, when I was buying these, these probably cost about 50 pence each. You were buying them in a 10 pack for like 4 99 You know, these sounded great. Again, the hiss is the main reason. You can't say they're amazing. But for an entry-level tape to use in your boombox in them days, what more did you want? Tough, good looking, good sounded, makes a really good copy. Like I say, it's just the hisses there. So let's move on 10 years now and look at this, which is going to be the BASF or MTech version of the UI. Is this just going to be like just every other Ferro Extra? Is that necessarily a bad thing? Uh, let's have a listen. Let's uh, get it all uh, biased up and see. But... Uh, I mean, if it's just like a regular Ferro Extra, it should be okay. But like I say, this is it's quite an attractive little cassette, this. And it's quite a strange one because, like I say, everything else, you are, you are. And I keep saying, like I say, a lot. 
but you are you are and then we've got this original you are and I don't know what the thoughts were behind that but let's have a see if it sounds any good so this next track is called the high line let's have a see how this one goes Again, a very competent cassette. It sounded well, it still had the hiss, but it captured the highs, it captured the bass. That was quite a bassy uh, track, that one. But yeah, I guess the thing to think about through all its guys is no matter who made it, you could always rely on who you are. So throughout the years, from the first to the last, whether they were genuinely made by Maxell or they were made by somebody else, the UR has always been a dependable cassette. I remember using and abusing many of them and I don't remember any of them ever being thrown away until, well, I purged myself of cassettes in the early part of the new millennium, which I regret to this day, but there we go. But the point is, Max L U R is a legendary cassette. It's as good as a D, it's as good as a HF, it's as good as the other entry level cassettes, but I found them to be very tough as well. Maybe not the most attractive, maybe quite, you know, boring insofar as, you know, for many generations they look the same. But for value for money, bang for buck, combined with the quality of the tape in them and the hardiness. The UR deserves its reputation as being a legendary cassette that I think all of us used at some point. So thanks again for watching. Stay safe out there. Just do some more taping. Please like and subscribe. Until the next video, take care. Bye bye.